Hi gang, here's a cool looking high voltage power supply I made, called the Cube. As you can see, it can do some pretty cool stuff. It's different than my other similar power supply in that it doesn't have the hard to find parts. I show you how it all came about, how I made it, and some demonstrations. It all started when I found this gutted TV someone had thrown out. All that was left in it was literally this, a flyback transformer, the main component needed to produce the high voltage. I found this nice black plastic box, and wouldn't you know it, the flyback transformer fit nicely inside. I next drew up this circuit diagram for the power supply, and gathered the rest of the parts. Those are a 220 ohm resistor and a 27 ohm resistor, a 4700 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, two 2 and 3055 or equivalent power transistors. The transistors needed to be mounted on a heat sink to take the heat away, and they're mounted on the heat sink using mounting kits. And after some cleanup, here's that flyback transformer I found. The high voltage DC will come from this thick wire, and the lower DC voltage is available from this one, called the focus wire. In a video where I showed how to make a 30 kV high voltage power supply, I used this flyback transformer with this multiplier. Notice the difference. This flyback has just a rectangular core and a coil wrapped around it. These are hard to find. The one I'm using now has the core and coil, but also has a lot of other stuff. That other stuff consists of at least some diodes that turn the AC from the coil into DC. That's part of why I had this other hard to find part, the multiplier, in that other power supply. So I didn't use a multiplier this time. The other thing the multiplier did was step up the voltage, so I don't get as high a voltage from this power supply. And finally, I used these two binding posts for connecting to external power. Before doing any testing, I had to put these coils on the flyback transformer. Both coils are center tapped, meaning there's an extra wire connected to the middle. This black one is 18 gauge wire and has five turns on this side and five more on this side. This red one is 24 gauge wire and has two turns on this side and two turns on this side. I prepared the wires with the center ones ahead of time. I did all windings in the same direction. And here's the finished result, with a little tape to hold it together. To make sure it would work, I wired it up using a breadboard. When I turned it on, I got small sparks. At the same time, I looked at the pins on the flyback that go to the coils inside. One of them was arcing to the core. Basically, I looked for any pin that had corona or behaved this way. That was the high voltage return pin. So I connected that to earth ground and tested some more. Next, I attached the transistors to the heatsink and wired them back to the circuit. Testing this time, I got much better results. I made a cardboard template for the holes for mounting the heatsink and transistors, and then made the holes. I then drilled holes beside that for the two binding posts. I mounted the heatsink and transistors first. Notice that I had to use two red binding posts, cheating by putting black tape on one of them. I didn't have the necessary nuts for the other ones. The flyback transformer sits in this corner, with the high voltage coils back here, away from all the other low voltage stuff. There's one wire to go to the high voltage return pin on the bottom, so I soldered that on first. I also added a little corona dope to help with losses to other pins or to the core. Then I noticed that there were two support holes on the bottom here that fit nylon bolts just fine. I put a second set of nuts on to keep the pins from contacting the cube base. Next I drilled two matching holes in the bottom of the cube and bolted the flyback in place. I shortened the bolts and added some legs to keep what's left off the table and to further isolate the pins from the table. At this point I decided to add some ventilation, so I removed some plastic from the sides and hot glued in some non-electrically conductive perforated material. Next was to get the resistors and capacitor off the breadboard and onto a perf board. That was followed by a little soldering and labeling to make these connections. I wanted this board to go in around here, so I cut up some plastic and made a holder that the circuit board could slide in and out of. I couldn't fit the glue gun in the tight space, so I epoxied it in instead. And now that the parts were in place, it was time for the wiring. Since the transistor's basis are toward the bottom of the case, I connected those wires first. I started with connecting the flyback's red wire on the outside of the coils to the base of the transistor I'd labeled as Q1, then the inside red wire to the base of the transistor Q2. Then I did the transistor's collectors, which go to the black coils I'd put on the flyback. I connected the black wire on the outside of the coil to transistor Q1's collector. Then I connected the black wire on the inside to transistor Q2's collector. 
Then I prepared a wire stripped in two places in the middle. This was basically for all these things connected to ground at the ground binding post. I connected one end to the 27 ohm resistor and the negative of the capacitor where I put the label to ground. Then one middle section went to the ground binding post, the bottom one. At the same time I connected the high voltage return wire from the flyback to there too, to ground it. The next middle section went to transistor Q2's emitter, and the other end went to transistor Q1's emitter. I next connected the center tap of the flyback's red coil to the common point for the resistors that I'd labeled feedback coil center. And lastly I connected a red wire from the 220 ohm resistor and capacitor positive to the positive input binding post, the top one. At the same time I connected the center tap of the flyback's black coil to that binding post too. And here's the flyback in the cube and all wires connected. This black wire is a voltage for focus, and this white one is for screen. I didn't need them. The focus one came out easily. The white one didn't, so I decided I'd tuck that away. Next, I cut off the cup where the connection to the TV's cathode ray tube was made, and replaced it with a more useful ring terminal. And after making a hole in the cover, I put it on and screwed it in place. Done. Time for some tests and demonstrations. Here's my first test setup. I connected the cube to my homemade 24 volt DC power supply. I can vary the input and output voltage using this variac. I attached a brass ball to the output's ring terminal. I connected a long wire to ground with the other end terminating at an alligator clip. I turned on the power supply and started turning up the voltage. And then at higher voltages I get this nice wavy steady arc. I wanted to power it using this laptop adapter to make it real portable. So first I made some measurements with my 24 volt power supply by connecting an ammeter in series between them. At 10 volts the cube requires around 1.9 amps and at 20 volts it requires 3.8 amps. Unfortunately the laptop adapter puts out 20 volts and can handle only 1.8 amps. So I couldn't use it. Here I'd set it up so I could see what the output voltage looks like when there's no load. I put the tip of my Fluke high voltage 80k-40 probe against the power supply's output and connected it to my oscilloscope. When I turned it on, I got a surprise. Instead of pulse DC output, I saw flat DC. This is 8.3 kilovolts or 8300 volts. I turned it up to 20 kilovolts and you can see that there's this 120 hertz ripple on top. But at 10 kilovolts there's no noticeable ripple. 20 kilovolts took around 20 volts DC input. Any higher and the transistors heated up too fast. Then came the real fun, a Jacob's Ladder or a traveling arc. I attached two paper clips to a piece of wood and bent them so that the bottom here was wider than the top here and with the sharp ends turned away a bit. I connected one paper clip to the power supply's output and the other to ground. It took a lot of adjusting of the distance between the paper clips and the voltage but I got it to work. This alone made it worth making this power supply. Well, thanks for watching. See my YouTube channel, Rimstar.org, for other how-to videos like this. That includes one showing step-by-step -step how I made my other high-voltage DC power supply, another on how to make a lifter that uses these high-voltage power supplies to fly, and for variety, one on how to make a Stirling engine using a tomato paste can. And don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos, or give a thumbs up or leave a question or comment below. See you soon.